Cause you're true 
your voice and help me say this. Name above all names. Name above all names. Blessing. Blessing. And honor. And honor. Name above all names. Name above all names. Dominion. Dominion. And power. And power. Name above all names. Name above all names. Righteous. Righteous. And holy. And holy. Name above all names. Was dead. He is alive. He reigns forever. He reigns forever. He is the Christ. He is the Christ. Exalted, lifted high. Exalted, exalted. Glorified, glorified. Exalted, exalted. Magnified, magnified. A Jesus, a Jesus. Everybody, clap your hands. Come on and clap your hands. Come on and clap.
the Lamb So glad I've been washed In the blood The blood of the Lamb How many of you are glad that you've been washed In the blood of the Lamb Lord, this is the this is the sound of the redeemed ones, Jesus. This is the sound of the blood-bought people, Jesus. We're glad to be washed in the blood. 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 Glad to be washed. In Glad to be washed in the blood. Glad to be washed in the blood. I'm so glad. I've been washed. I've been washed in the blood. The blood of the Lamb. So. Blood, the blood of the Lamb. Saved by His power, born again by His Spirit. Blood flowed from His feet and hands. Now I am a brand new man. The blood that atoned for me was applied to the mercy seat. Jesus, my high priest, used His blood for my life. I'm so glad I've been washed in the blood, the blood of the Lamb. So glad, so glad I've been washed in the blood, the blood of the Lamb. The blood covers me. Protects me, blood redeemed me. The blood broke the chains off me. The blood destroyed the yoke, gives me access to his throne. The blood heals every sickness and disease. The blood sets the captives free. Yeah. I'm so glad I've been wise. The blood of the Lamb I'm so glad So glad I've been washed I've been washed If you're glad for the blood tonight Lift your hands all over the room Begin to tell the strength
those hands to hold. Jehovah Rapha is in the room. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's declare that one more time. You heal my heart. You heal my soul. You heal my body. And you make me whole. Your healing blood. Infirmities in the name of Jesus, I am here, I am free. <laughs> Worship the healing power tonight. Worship the one who has healing power. You are Jehovah our Father. There's a sound that needs to be released out of your spirit right now. Just release that sound in your spirit. <laughs>
Make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. Never 
burn out In the fire on my altar Never burn out Lord, make me a house of prayer May the fire on my altar Never burn out Fire on my altar Never burn out May the fire on my altar Never burn out Make me a house of prayer We pray Lord, make me a house Make me a house suicidal thoughts. We break that off you right now in Jesus' name. We speak life over you. Life. Long life.
Just lift our hands all over the room. A little longer. Let's linger just a little bit longer. Just tell him that you love him. Love you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Sang about the blood a little bit ago. I was sitting up there and I just felt like saw waves of his blood sweeping out across the congregation. Some of you really battled accusation today. I want to tell you that it's not more real than the blood. So just let that blood, the blood of Jesus, just sweep that out right now. All pain in your body has to go. It's not more real. It's not more real than the cross. It's not more real than the blood. It cannot stand. give the Lord a shout. Our appreciation to this team. They ministered to our students this morning and it was over the top. The stories, what God has delivered a handful of these young people from is just amazing, just amazing. So give somebody a high five, head back to your seats. All right, while you're doing that, i got a couple of announcements. We're going to put the encounter dates up on the screen here for you. And I want you to notice they're going to be every two weeks. It'll be really easy to remember. Also, Journey is tomorrow night down in the cafe. And also, if you have not registered for Power and Love this weekend, you need to do that. Okay, you need to do that. It's going to be over the top. It's going to be awesome. So I have the privilege and the honor to welcome to the platform Todd White. All right, can you hear me? What'd you think of that? Come on. If you only knew the stories, like they they were here today, they taught at LCU. By the way, Eddie is gonna be sharing at LCU, so if anybody wants to audit 
he's going to be sharing tomorrow, but he's beautifully shared today. But he has, I, I call them all trophies of grace. Just really, like his crew, they are trophies of grace. That really is what it is. I, I'm, I'm about to bring a young man up here to share a testimony that is going to. Come on. <laughs> I don't know if we understand what God really wants to do. <clears throat> he can take the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst and make it a truth, make him a trophy for the grace of God. <laughs> up here, when you see all these folks up here, in this, you see a lot of people that have been redeemed out of drugs and all kinds of tragedy that Jesus has absolutely transformed their life. I mean, transform their life. I'm going to bring a young man up here right now. I heard his testimony this morning. I just sat out there and cried. <laughs> Never heard nothing like this. <laughs> like, pretty amazing. Ezekiel, you want to come out of here? This is Ezekiel. He's a man of God. You're lucky he's a man of God. <laughs> I'm not kidding, man. <laughs> Go ahead and share what Jesus did for you, man. Hey. All right, I'm Ezekiel. I'm 29 years old. At the age of eight years old, I was molested. That opened up a door to pornography, to drinking and smoking. And at the age of 13 years old, I joined the Crips gang. From 13 to 19, I was gang banging. I was running the streets, robbing people, stealing. And at the age of 19 years old, there was a hit put out for my life. The rival gang tried to decapitate me. I woke up in a hospital and the doctor said he didn't know how I survived because my juggler vein was cut. But it's by the grace of God that I'm here right now. Ezekiel, I want you to show them your scar. Look at his neck. You see that? My grandfather took me from the hospital to a shift revival service. And that night I had an encounter with God that changed my life. I went home and I woke up the next day. I was looking in the mirror at the scar on my neck. I said, God, if you're real, you'll make sure I have that love, the peace, the joy, the happiness that they have. Because I didn't have that. I was trying to fill a void with things of the world. I was trying to cover up a scar that could only be filled and fixed with the love of God. Three hours later, I got a phone call from my grandfather asking if I wanted to come to Eddie James Ministries. I traveled for about a year and a half, but because I wasn't praying, I wasn't reading the word, I wasn't fasting, I wasn't doing the things I needed to do to sustain my freedom. I went back to the drugs, I went back to the gangs, I went back to the things that I got delivered from, and I ended up going to prison for almost six years. I maxed out on my prison sentence. I did more than half of my time in solitary confinement. At one point in time, I did 250 days in solitary confinement. The Lord spoke to me when I was in solitary. He told me to leave the gangs alone, but because of my disobedience, I ended up getting into a gang war when I got out of solitary confinement. I was cut three times on the right side of my face, on the left side of my arm. When I got out of solitary confinement, I, I, I was just deep in the gang wars. I was in and out of solitary. I got out of prison, and I was still running from the purpose and destiny that God had for me. And I ended up becoming addicted to fentanyl and cocaine. My second time doing fentanyl was a Percocet 30. I overdosed and died. They narcanned me four times. The paramedic said that he wasn't going to narc him me again after that. He was just going to let me go. But God had a plan for my life. That just took me down this long road of drug addiction for two and a half years. I lost my house. I lost my job. I lost my car. I got kicked out of my mom's house, kicked out of my sister's. And, the God, and, and God brought me to a place where... I was broken, I was suicidal, I was depressed, I was bound to drug addiction, and he brought me to a place where I had nothing else to turn to or nobody else to turn to but to turn to him and to cry out to him. And I said, God, what am I going to do at this point in my life? Where am I going to go? And he spoke to me and told me to go to Eddie James Ministries. And I've been clean for 10 months now.
And I want to let y'all know this. If he could do it for me, he could do it for anybody. If he could do it for me, if he could bring me from where he bought me from, because I feel, I feel like I was one of the worst of the worst. He could do it for you. I want to let you know that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. <laughs> Put your hands towards this man, please. Father, I thank you for every bridge that was thought to be burned. I thank you that every one of those will be opened. I thank you for the inroad to every family member that was hurt. I thank you to the inroad to every gang member that's out there, God, that the Crips will be saved in Jesus' name. Father, thank you. I thank you for radical increase on this man of God. I thank you for the flame of heaven upon him, God. Anoint him for battle in Jesus' name. Anoint him for battle in Jesus' name, God. I thank you for the fire of heaven upon this young man. I thank you that he will run and not grow weary. He will walk and not faint. He, he will burn, God, and there's nothing that's going to put this flame out ever again. God, I thank you in the name of Jesus. God, we break the power of the enemy trying to whisper lies to this man. I thank you that he'd be consumed with truth. I thank you that his life has purpose and value. God, I thank you that he is a trophy of grace. God, I ask you in the name of Jesus for grace to be multiplied upon to this man. God, thank you for the flame of heaven. God, I ask you to give him the words to say to slice through the hearts of every brute beast in this world that thinks that they're God, but they're not. God, thank you that he would, he would have the words to cut right through to the heart. That Jesus, they would have a heart of flesh, that you'd rip out their heart of stone, that you give them a heart of flesh. God, let this man know your grace even more. God, thank you for the power of Jesus upon his life. I thank you, Father, that ain't nobody gonna take this away from this man, nobody. Father, thank you. Thank you for this trophy, God. Thank you for this trophy. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, we love you. We say yes, God. God, we pray for Ezekiel that he would burn everywhere he goes. God, I thank you for millions and millions of people coming to Jesus through this evangelist. God, I thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for every bit of guilt, shame, and condemnation. Lord, that stuff will be cut out completely, absolutely, not even a thought of that. In the name of Jesus, he would be a beacon of light, that he would be a beacon of truth everywhere he goes. God, I thank you for your grace on his life. I thank you, Father. Lord, I thank you for this man of God being an amazing father. God, thank you that he's gonna step into being a father one day and he's gonna be the most amazing father. He's gonna step into being a husband, gonna be the most amazing husband. God, I thank you that his family will be products of grace. Father, thank you for your amazing goodness. Mark him, mark him, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, thank you that this is just a picture of what you want to do. It doesn't matter how bad, doesn't matter how dark, doesn't matter how deep. What matters is how much God loves us and the price he paid. Father, thank you for this mighty man of God. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for healing and wholeness for every organ. In Jesus' name, Father, thank you. Brand new liver, God. I thank you for a brand new bloodstream. In Jesus' name, God, thank you. You're amazing, Father. We love you. God, thank you. Lord, I thank you for Ezekiel's nighttime being restored to him, that he'd never be robbed again, that he would not wake up in a dream and think he's somewhere that he's not. Father, I thank you that you would give him dreams of heaven, Lord. I thank you for this mighty man of God. Lord, bless him and overwhelm him. In Jesus' mighty name, I thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. See, I see you mentoring gang members, man, bringing them out one by one by one by one. I'm telling you, man, they are not too hard. Because <laughs> where God gave you great breakthrough, that is where your breakthrough will be. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you. 
rescuer, bondage breaker. <laughs> bondage breaker. Bondage breaker. Bondage breaker. Bondage breaker. We oh, thank you for this man of God. Jesus, thank you. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless him, Father. Jesus, name. Eddie, come here, man. Let's just pray over him real quick. Sorry, guys. Just... <laughs> There's so much more for you to kill. You just touching the fringe of it. Yes. Jesus. God, I thank you that some of the most deepest, most difficult cases of gang members will come to Jesus. Some of the most ruthless ones. God. That you will use Zeke's story yeah. and Zeke's life to rescue them. I see them coming from the bloods, from the crypts, from, uh, from Latin kings, from yeah. God. All of these gangster disciples, I just see them coming. MS 13, God, I thank you, Lord, that you will use Zeke's story to turn these gang leaders and gang members into Holy Ghost warriors. For you. That's right. In the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, that Zeke will walk in the prophetic. Zeke will walk with such discernment, God, that he will look at people and hear the word of the Lord and release it to them. And they will drop to their knees and know of a truth. His God is the true God. God, I thank you, Lord, for every memory of things that the enemy used him to do, God, that those memories will, not, will no longer torment, That's right. God, but they will be testimonies. That's right testimonies of your faithfulness and of your goodness. I thank you, God, for his little children, God, that he right. his two boys, God, that they will be raised as warriors for you. <laughs> they will not be held captive by the things that he was held captive by, but That's that right. he is the generational curse breaker. That's right. He breaks the generational curse over his That's family right. line. In the That's name right. of Jesus, he will never lack for anything, God. I thank you, God, that you will provide in every aspect of his life. In the name of Jesus, thank you. Amen. 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 Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Love you. I don't know if the church is ready for that. I'm serious. Man, I, I love testimony so much. People are like, yeah, well, get why we're saved. This is that's why we're born again. This is why we're alive. You know, I was listening to a song by... Lauren Daigle, how many of you ever heard of her? Did you ever hear the song Rescue? That's my song. I know, that's my song too. So Briley and I were driving today. I was taking her to school and we were listening to that song. And Briley, she got a voice on her, man. I can't wait till she's revealed. She does. She's got, I'm telling you, I should bring her up here and let her sing for you. She's something. Yeah. So she, we're singing it. You know, it starts out low. Like, I will, and then it's, and Bradley hits all of it. Like, it's crazy. 
So we're in the car and I, I turned, I paused it and I said, Riley, I want you to listen to it from a different perspective. Because the song says, I will send down an army to find you in the middle of the darkness. I, come on, I will rescue you. And, and God says that about us, but guess what? You're the army. See this, it's not, see God, God has angels, but angels are not able to share the gospel. <laughs> he uses people. Come on, angels can direct, they point, they're here to help us, those that inherit salvation. Their help, they're our help. But God gave us the job of being the army that gets to share the reality of who God is with people. And that's really, really true. So I told Riley, she goes, oh my gosh, dad, that's totally different. <laughs> I said, man, every time I hear it, I just bawl because we're the army, amen? All right, I wanna share with you just a, a couple minutes here real quick, something that I was looking at today. If you don't mind with me, if you can go to Luke 16 real quick. Oh. Man, I love testimonies. I can't even tell you. I can just listen to them for 24 hours a day of what God has done in a life. It's awesome. It's not a cool story. It's not a cool story, bro, T-shirt. It is a testimony. It means what God did once, he'll do it again with the same power he did it before. So in Luke 16, um, it, it's, it talks about the unjust steward. And it's talking about this, this man that the master said, listen, uh, you, I'm going to need you to bring me account, bring, bring to account like what you're doing with my money because you're not doing a good job. So this unjust steward goes out there in fear because he knows that like he's about to lose his job. So he's like, what am I going to do when I lose my job? Like, I, I can't dig. I don't think he wanted to dig. I don't think that he couldn't. I just don't think he wanted to. Because when you're stewarding, when you're, when you're somebody that's over someone's finances, our finances is a little bit different than hard labor, right? Because you're, you're not used to that. But either way, the story goes and it talks about this man, how he went out and he found this master's creditors that owed him all this money. Now, he wouldn't have a guy that's over his accounts unless it was more than one or two accounts. You don't need somebody to do that. Like you need somebody to do that with many accounts. So this guy gives a couple examples. He went out to one, he said, how much do you owe? He said, 100, he said, pay 50. So he's like, he's, he's bringing in money, but what he's doing is he's shortchanging his master. Why? Because the ulterior motive is that when I get kicked out of my master's house, maybe these people are gonna take me in, right? But I want to get to this point. So this, this is crazy because I don't know if we see this. I, I, when I got saved, I saw it because I was a thief. I talked about it. I, I've been talking about it a lot lately. When I first got saved, I never worked before. And I did. I, got, I quit or got fired by everything I did. And when I came home from Teen Challenge, I was such a mess when I left. When I came back, one of the ways for me to prove that this was real was me actually putting my hand to the plow and working getting a job and providing for my family. Because I didn't ever provide, all I did was steal. And so in Ephesians it says, let a man steal no longer, but let him work with his hands. Why? Come on, I, my students know it, but do you guys know it? It says, it says, let a man work with his hands so that he might have something to give to those in need. So why do we work? But that's not why we work. Usually we work to provide, we need to provide, we need to make sure that we have our, our, our family, everything like that. And God, he's not against you providing for your family, but that's not the motivation for working. The motivation is working to give. That is so far away from the body of Christ. Are you hearing me? Like when somebody talks about money, people put up their walls, they're like, all right, you know, I'm cutting this part out, let's get to the message. Well, here's the problem with cutting it out. Look at this. So Jesus says, in verse, starting in verse 10, he's talking about people being faithful in that which is least. 
So God calls money least. He calls it least because the problem is, is that the way that we've been raised, look out for me, myself, and I, what happens is money is God in many people's lives. So God says be faithful in that which is least. If you're faithful in the least, which is money, you can be faithful with most. It's kind of crazy. We don't see it that way because we're so used to our culture. You got to work to live. You got to earn a living. You got to do this. You got to pay bills. And sometimes when it comes down to first fruits, we're like, well, I get it. I mean, first fruits, if I have something left over, we're not supposed to tip God at the end. We're supposed to first fruits at the beginning. You can say what you want, but you're not going to get out of scripture. When you get to heaven to stand before Jesus, it's still there. <laughs> it says, he who is faithful in verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you true riches and trust you with true riches? If you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give to you what is your own? No master can, or no, no servant can serve two masters. For he who hate the one Love the other, or you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. I know many people have talked about this, and there, honestly, there are people that are, that are preaching prosperity. There are people out there that are preaching prosperity for selfish gain. There are people that do manipulative offerings and, and say, you know, if you guys don't do this, our electric's gonna get shut off. And if you don't, that's manipulation. That's, you can't be a cheerful giver with anything like that. You're a manipulated giver, you're a maneuvered giver, and that's not God. Are you hearing me? It's not God to, to beg and plead with you to, to part with money. If, if we had God be Lord, if we had Jesus be Lord and we had money be a servant, money makes an amazing servant but a terrible master. See, when God's your master, money's your servant. When money's your master, God will never be your servant. Well, it's scripture. It's not just good. See, the thing is, is you know, for 19 years, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've had all kinds of accusations about prosperity preacher just because of my association with different pastors, which is so weird. But anyway, I've been, and so like a couple of weeks ago, and my students know it, I was getting ready to teach on a Monday morning, and the Holy Spirit said to me, he goes, I have given you a revelation on finances. You've always been a giver, a tither. You've been a sower. You failed to teach these principles because there's the fear of man in your life. So that's kind of hard because I would be one that you would say definitely the fear of man's not in there. But if I'm afraid to share on the principles of giving, then obviously something's wrong. And it is the fear of man because I'm afraid of how people might hear me. Problem, I am not supposed to be afraid of how you might hear me because if every other thing in my life, I'm bold and I will go after God. We go after God personally as a family in sowing and offering. But if I don't teach the principles, here's what God said. I'm now holding you accountable for everyone that you don't share with or everyone that you fail to share this principle with. So I got convicted, so I came into school. And I'm like, hey, guys, we're going to talk about money today. And the students were like, what? Because that's not normal. But it is normal in the kingdom. Here's why it's normal. Jesus says, if I can't be faithful in this, I can't be faithful in anything. Are you hearing me? I will lose people here. People will bail. People will be upset at me. I don't care. Here's what I care about. Your money is seed. And if you don't treat it as seed, your money won't be reproduced. There's people that give with the motivation of all kinds of different motivations. I'm telling you that any motive that's not of love is the wrong motive for giving. I, I want to give. And here's another thing. I want to give where I'm fed. I, I told the students the other day, when's the last time you went to a restaurant over here, but you went to the restaurant beside it to pay your bill? That's stupid. I went and ate at this restaurant, but then I went next door to pay my bill. They'll look at you and be, go pay your bill where you, where you ate. So if you're being fed somewhere, so into it. Why? Because that's what we do. We sell where we're being fed. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. You guys all right? Yeah, I lose people and they get upset. They're like, talk about something else. The reason why we have that problem is because money's Lord to you. You can say what you want to say. I'm, a, I'm not kidding. Oh, I like this so much. Just <laughs> mm. Many think that money is something for mature Christians to deal with and that salvation and living a holy life 
are the simple things. But Jesus says that money is the least thing and the most important thing that gets handled first. Mm. Mammon means money, and we need to talk about this because Jesus said in, in this parable that trusting God in the area of finances is the least area of trust. And if you can't do that, then greater things can't be entrusted to you. Okay. Watch, if you can't bench 35 pounds, it's probably stupid to get under a 150-pound bench. Are you hearing me? How many of you have ever bench pressed before? All the ladies. Just kidding. If you can't, if you can't put up 35 pounds, to put 150 pounds on the bar is a foolish idea. So what happens is when we start to be faithful in this, then we can be trusted with this because we're faithful with this. And as we increase our faithfulness, God provides seed to the sower. I'm telling you right now that scripturally, that if God sees that I am actually a sower and not a hoarder, not somebody that just stores up this, it says lay up for yourselves treasures in where moth and rust can't destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures here, but lay up for yourselves treasures there. What does that even mean? I don't know of any better place to invest in than eternity. It, watch, here's the final thing I'm going to say. If God knows that he can get seed through you, then he will get seed to you. If he cannot get it through you, he will not get it to you. And it's all a faith journey. I'm serious. People are like, all right, be done. I am done. Listen, <laughs> here's the thing. Is if when someone talks about money, you get offended, <clears throat> It's because you have an issue with it. <clears throat> and your issue with it is that it's still this least thing that needs to be tackled. It's not okay to not be faithful in what is least. Because God wants to trust you with true riches. And I'm not saying like airplanes and all those different things. I'm telling you that there's nothing better than to invest in eternity and to sow into the reality of making disciples and to, transfer, and to have people transformed and to have people out there sh sharing the gospel, spreading the gospel. So that's not just a Todd White sharing, it's every student sharing, it's every student's family getting overwhelmed by God, it's the Amish communities get, are getting transformed. It's, it's all around the world, it's pastors. A pastor came up to me yesterday and I, I <clears throat> We did a, we just did a, we did a comfort, we did a power and love school over in Brazil. And this first Baptist pastor came up to me in the airport and I thought, this might not be good. <laughs> not that, there's nothing wrong with first Baptist. Please don't hear me like that. But I'm telling you that I, I might not preach there. <clears throat> Maybe not. I mean, if they asked me, I would come, but I don't know. And I would wear a suit. I don't have a problem. I don't, I don't, because I'm a product of grace. This first Baptist pastor came up to me and I didn't know what he was gonna say and he looked at me and he goes, I was at the Power and Love this weekend. He said, I just wanna tell you that my life was forever changed. Wow. Like, man, come on, God, do it. Do it. Do it. And he began to tell me how his whole life had been changed. We did a fire tunnel on Saturday night, normal fire tunnel, and the church asked if they could, you know, just like make it an open service. And there were like 3,000 young adults that they brought in. And there was like 2,000 people that, that came, of all the power and love people that were there for the day and a half or almost, you know, the two days. And then 5,000 came all together. And so we did a fire tunnel and laid hands on 5,000 people. <laughs> It was glorious. God baptized people that have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were endued with power. I'm talking about piles of bodies everywhere. I'm not kidding. Like I'm talking piles, like piles of people that God was overwhelming. People are like, well, I don't believe it. Well, maybe you need to be in the pile. Maybe. <laughs> I need more of God in my life. Are you hearing me? I don't need more theories. I need him. I need his presence. 
<clears throat> we were praying for, the, praying for the sick, you know, of course. We saw so many people healed. Actually, I went out to eat lunch with a friend today, and he brought another friend with him. And uh, he has kidney, he's on kidney dialysis. His kidneys don't work. And I, and I knew at the lunch table that Jesus was going to heal him. And I, I, just, I just knew it. And we prayed at the lunch table, and I got a text on my way here. He hasn't peed in two years, and he peed right after lunch today. I don't know if you, I don't know if you, he couldn't pee because his kidneys don't work and he peed, which means his kidneys are working. Guys, come on. He's right there. Is it RJ? Is it right there? Eddie? He wants to hug you. He loves you. That's the man with the new kidneys right there. <laughs> Eddie's one of his favorite worship leaders, so I, I set that up. <laughs> there was a, they brought me out of the, the church when I was leaving, I was getting ready to go to the hotel. It was 1.30 in the morning. I, I stayed there and prayed for everybody, all the staff, all the church staff. I just had such a wonderful time. Pastor's like, if you're tired, you can get, and I said, no, I'm good. Let's just, I'm only here for a couple days. Let, let me pour my soul and all my guts into this place. I love that. See, people are like, I want to do what you do. I don't think you know what I do. I don't just do meetings. I spend time with leadership. I spend time, I saturate leadership. I spend time with pastors and, 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 and it's a church that has, they went from 500 people two years ago to 15,000 in two years. So to have 15,000 people, you might have a couple of pastors. So I sat there and just, I ministered to all of them and prayed for all of them for two days and had the most wonderful time and I'll sleep enough when I die. Jesus said, sleep. Listen, this is a big deal. I want to pour my life into this. And you guys don't understand that, that in the ministry, like the reality of this is we have LCU here. But I am traveling all around the world. I, I came home from Brazil. I, I got home, what's today? Tuesday morning at 6.30. I get home. I get to my house at 7 o'clock. And, and I... I told my wife, don't bother getting up. I'm going to get Azariah. So I went and got my, she did get up. You got Azariah up. But I got him dressed and fed him and took him to school. And then came here to LCU and taught LCU in the morning. I got here at 8.30 for worship. I got here right in time for worship. And they're like, Anthony looks at me and he goes, you're a machine, dude. I go, no, there's grace on my life. Like I'm talking about real grace. And I got to share with the students, and I think it was a pretty amazing time. I was overwhelmed. I feel like I got born again again. And it was special to me. And then I went out with a friend of mine, and, or uh, the, the vice president who was in town for the week, and, or for a couple of days, and I went, hey, dude, let's go play some golf. So I went and played golf after that and touched people on the golf course. And it's amazing what God wants to do through a life that's yielded if we just see why we're here. But man, I'm telling you right now that when you guys sow into lifestyle, you're not just sowing into like the meeting. You're sowing into eternity because we are making a difference. And I'm telling you right now that this is good soil. It's good soil. There's lots of transformation. So I want everybody to get ready to give. We're just going to take an offering. And you can do what you want. I'm not, this is not manipulation. And do not give if you're not cheerful. Do not give if you feel manipulated. But I'm gonna tell you right now that if you start to read your Bible and find out what finances, what Jesus, Jesus talked about finances more than anybody. And he said, this is the least, and if you can't be faithful in least, you can't be trusted with more. That's not maneuvering. That's saying from God's perspective, unrighteous mammon, this is what I say. Every form of currency in the United States has been used for something twisted. Money laundering, theft, embezzlement, drugs, pornography, all that stuff, when it's in your pocket, 
It's unrighteous mammon. But when it goes through your hand and you sow that into an offering, you are sending out every dollar bill as a soldier in the army to destroy hell. I'm not kidding. You're taking that money that's been used for everything polluted and you're saying, when it crosses through my hand, I am sowing with purpose and I'm going to destroy hell right now. So Father, I thank you for every person in here. I thank you for cheerful givers. I thank you for your amazing love for us. God, thank you that you give seed to the sower and he multiplies seed to the sower. God, I'm asking you to show as an example everyone that sows that you give seed to the sower. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. These are ways to give. All up here, there's a little scan code here. We've got Apple Pay, Venmo, PayPal, whatever GPay is. I don't know. Come on. I want to hear some destroy hells if I don't, if you don't mind. No, I'm, I'm telling you right now, like have faith, have faith that you're going to be faithful in what is least. I'm telling you. Think about it. Every dollar bill is a soldier in the army to destroy hell. You watch and see what your seed does. Amen. 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 Is that hard? Is that like really hard? Like talking about finances is really hard, right? Like, no, because people have jacked it up. That doesn't mean you have to be jacked up. Come on. So I'm going to share just a couple of testimonies. I'm going to share some principles. We're going to pray and God's going to show up. Why? Well, he's already here. He is. People are going to be healed and set free. I want to share another testimony. I was walking out at the end. I was sharing how I was tired. And I was coming out and there was this lady that had worked. She was a servant of, like, uh, like she just wanted to serve. So she was helping with food at the church that I was at in Brazil. And we walked outside and the guy goes, man, I know you're tired, man. I go, please stop saying that. Yeah, but you've been pouring out, man. We need to pray for you to be filled up. You can't fill me up with your prayer. Are you hearing me? I have God inside of me as a well of living water. You have no ability to fill that well. Only he can. And in the measure that I pour out, God pours back in abundantly. <laughs> this is really big. See, the Christian life, like, it's just like the bread. When the disciples, you know, that Philip said, I found a boy with a couple loaves of bread and, and two fish, but obviously it won't be enough to feed all these people. Jesus is like, I can picture him. <laughs> just have him sit down. I mean, I can picture, Jesus is like, Philip, you fool. No, he's like, just have him sit down. Why? Because the Holy Spirit multiplies. And as you give, the Holy Spirit multiplies more and more and more and more and more. If you see the principles of grace and the reality of what you really have, when you pour out, God pours back in. You can't outgive God. You can try, but you can't win. I'm telling you, you can give as much as you want. And God will bless you. Most people won't test God, won't try God on that. Because like, well, I gave before and he never gave me anything back. You gave with the wrong motive. Why do we give? God so loved the world that he, so why do we give? <laughs> love. It's love. That's why. Come on, man. We need to be possessed with this. So I'm walking out and yes, I'm tired. It's 1.30 in the morning and I got an hour drive to get to the next hotel. But it's okay. We get to the car and she goes, she said, if you can please pray for my husband. He had a motorcycle accident. He's paralyzed from the neck down. So he's in the car waiting for her. So we get to the car and, and this kid is totally bummed out, totally sad. And, and, and he had a motorcycle accident and he can't move his arms or his legs. And they were married before it happened. It happened a couple years ago. And like he hasn't moved. And so I came over to the car and he, he said, I got your book. And I said, that's awesome, man. He goes, I like your story. I said, it's not a story. I said, My, it's a testimony. <clears throat> it's what... God wants to do in a life that's yielded. And he's like, yeah. And I said, God wants to do it in your life, man. And he was like, thanks. And, and it was interpreted. So he didn't speak. He spoke Portuguese. And I haven't gotten that tongue yet. But I got interpreters that do it. And so we're sitting there. And I said, come on, let's pray. So we started praying. And his legs started burning. He's had no feeling in his legs since the motorcycle accident. His spinal cord is severed right here, the base of his neck. 
he starts, he starts burning and starts crying and his wife is freaking out. <laughs> and the people are all weeping and we're just praying for this kid. Prayed for him for about 10 minutes. His first, his one leg started burning. Then both of his legs were on fire. Then his feet were on fire and his legs were on fire. Then his legs started freaking out. And I was like, come on, God. <laughs> come on. And man, he got some feeling back in his legs. We prayed for him for probably a half an hour. And he was so excited because of what was happening. That's the beginning of a miracle that's happening where God, where the neck was completely severed, the spinal cord severed. But I thought with God, all things are possible. Do you understand that Jesus paid a super high price for you? Do you understand that Jesus gave you an inheritance? Do we understand that? Do you know what an inheritance is? An inheritance is what somebody paid a price for, whether they worked their whole life, they, they stored up, maybe it's, maybe it's riches, they stored up wealth in the bank account. And then when that person is going to die, they, they, they put their will out, they write their will, and each part of this inheritance is gonna be distributed to the people that are supposed to get those gifts. Now, with Jesus, he didn't just lay up for you a couple of different things. He laid up for you like everything that he carried. Jesus said, all that the Father has is mine, and all that I have is yours. So Jesus absolutely paid the price for us to walk in everything that he walked in on this earth, and we're supposed to actually do greater things. I, 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 that's hard for the human mind because sometimes we pray for an elbow and it doesn't get healed and we're thinking greater things. Well, oh, gosh, if I, I'm not even seeing an elbow healed. And sometimes we get discouraged, but I need you to understand, be faithful in little things and watch what God does and how he adds and how you can't, you, I'm telling you that God, he's, he's a multiplier. He's absolutely ridiculously amazing. And it's so exciting. And so the, God tells us that we have an inheritance. He has put an inheritance for us. We have an inheritance. But do you understand that God also says in Ephesians that he has an inheritance in you? that he has an inheritance in the saints. Do you know that when we get saved, we were a sinner, and then as a sinner, we got saved by grace through faith, by grace. Grace is such a voluptuously amazing, scandalous word. And so many people are freaked out by grace. They're like, well, I don't know, bro. I mean, grace, we don't want to be one of those grace guys. Yes, you do. You want to be one of those grace guys. You want to understand the grace of God because there's nothing you could do to earn it. There's nothing you could do. Like with a, with a guy like Ezekiel, all that bad stuff, God's just like, oh, precious. He's not like, how stupid, he did it again. That's not the father. God is not how stupid, you did it again. Listen, we were born stuck on stupid. We were born with the wisdom of man. It's sensual and demonic. It's full of self-seeking and envy and every evil thing is in there. We were cultivated by the very enemy of God and we've grown up that way. It's called the way that seems right to a man. The way that seems right to a man and the inheritance that Jesus paid to give us don't coexist. You cannot bring in the inheritance to the way that seems right to a man. You can't. The way that seems right to a man has to be excommunicated from your life. It has to be kicked so far out of the park smack so far out of the park that it has nothing to do with you and you have nothing to do with it. That involves a little bit of work on our end. Yes, we're saved by grace through faith, we're saved. But do you understand that God has works for you to do, but those works aren't something that you do in performance. Those works are something that you do as the byproduct of an understanding of the inheritance that you've received. And those works are done out of the inheritance that he's given you. Ah, he paid a price to give it to you. All you have to do is die already to have it. The Bible says, unless a man denies himself, what is self? What is he talking about? He's talking about the flesh. Well, what is the flesh governed by? See, we get, when we get born again, we get like old things pass away, literally, and all things become new. Not some things, all things. 
So I literally, when I came to God, when God said yes to me and my yes, because he said yes to me before I was born. Do you understand that? That he predestined you before the foundation of the world. Like he had you in mind before any mom or dad came together. Like it's really crazy to think about it. Like he really thinks highly of you. <laughs> he thinks so, look, and, and like, like the guy, like, like Ezekiel, like it just came up here and shared. He's just twisted and, and crazy and wild and people are dead because of the life that you live and all that. And man, God's just waiting until Ezekiel can take a look at Scripture after he gives himself to God. He can take a look at Scripture and understand that you didn't earn this thing. You didn't pay a price for this thing. I paid the price for you. So when we see that he paid a price for us, we step into this place and say, okay, I'm brand new. I've got a brand new spirit. My spirit inside of me is the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. He became sin who knew no sin so that I might become the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. I have become the righteousness of God. I didn't earn it. It's not self-righteousness. It's God's righteousness. It's right standing with God, not because of what I did, but because I believe that what Jesus did is enough. So now by grace, I freely have been given the gift of God in my life through Holy Spirit. He comes to make his home inside of me. The old me is gone and the new has come. God says, behold, I will do a... This is the new thing that we've ignored. Behold, I will do a new thing. God already did the new thing. He was separate from you. He didn't like it. He sent his son to redeem you. He redeemed you, he purchased you, he bought you, he took you out of slavery, he took you out of the muck, out of the miry clay, he puts your feet on a rock, you're supposed to stand on that rock, and you're not supposed to be moved. Problem, we get our feet put on the rock, and then all of a sudden, we keep thinking like the old man thought, and don't renew ourselves in the spirit of our mind. So now we have old things that have passed away, and all things become new, and we're having so much trouble just believing that we've been forgiven. It's the hardest thing. Now we've got this like, wait a minute. So like, God just like, doesn't think about my past? No, he actually doesn't. Because when you get born again, he removes it. As far as the east is from the west, the covenant that he makes with us is my sins and my lawless deeds, he remembers no more. But the devil remembers it vividly. So he wants to take you back to that, make you live that every day so you can never live in things present and things to come. And you can never step into your inheritance and you don't really believe he has an inheritance inside of you because you keep going through the same stuff again and again and we're in this hamster wheel cycle of unbelief. But if you would see, if you would see what God thinks about you and what God says about you, if you'd stop reading stupid newspapers, <laughs> if you'd stop looking at everybody else's stuff, if you'd stop going on Facebook to see if someone liked your stuff, if you'd stop like looking on Facebook, did they like me, did they not? The reason why we crave that is because we lack love. We have a culture that needs to be liked because they don't understand they've been loved. And when I see the love of God, it takes me away from Facebook. I mean, I don't, I'm telling you right now, I, like, you post, you went to the grocery store. So what? <laughs> nah, I'm at, the, I'm at the coffee shop with my friend. We're just hanging out. So what? <laughs> well, that's insensitive. No, it's not. Like, who cares you went to the coffee shop? Did anybody get saved? Did anybody get touched? Did you share your faith? Are you confident enough to share your faith? Are you sharing your faith at the coffee shop? Did you go to the grocery store and actually shop with Jesus? Or do you just, are you entertained with people liking your stuff because you don't know you're loved? <laughs> this book is a love letter. <laughs> this shows me what he thinks about me. Man, when I look at this book and I see this Old Testament, like, it's scary. Oh my gosh, like really, Lord? Oh, that's crazy. But then when I go into the New Testament, I'm like, this is totally different. Like, what's the deal? 
Are you, have you ever done that? Have you ever read the Old Testament? You're like the fatty liver. <laughs> sacrifice the bulls. 12,000 bulls were sacrificed that day. And we're, and we're, just, we're thinking like, that's a lot of meat. <laughs> but then you go to this New Testament and you, it's totally different. And you, you notice that the New Testament doesn't talk about when you get to heaven? <laughs> it doesn't talk about it. It talks about your life here. <laughs> the New Testament doesn't even, it shares being born again. And, and that one day we're going to get there, right? It, it's going to happen. But born again is essential to unlock your potential. But if you don't understand your potential, you won't know your inheritance. And if you never read the will, if you, if, you never, if you never go to the reading of the will, you never understand what's been freely given to you. But when I open up the New Testament, I got to understand, see, Jesus, he has all of this, everything. He came and, and then he, he goes up on this tree and cursed is any man that hangeth on a tree and Jesus is, sin is cursed upon Jesus on that tree. God cursed sin in the flesh right there. And the thing that was killing us was cursed by God. And if I don't see this picture here, I mean, you got Moses in the Old Testament. Remember when all the vipers came out and were biting people and killing people? And, and Moses says, God, we, we got to do something about this. We repent. Like, how can we stop this? Like all these vipers, they're killing everybody. God says, take it. Take a bronze serpent. I want you to make a replica of a serpent, a bronze serpent. It's actually our medical sign, by the way. Take a bronze serpent, and I want you to tack it on a tree. And I want you to take this pole, and I want you to hold it up in front of the Hebrews. And every one of them that's dying from the poison, because what killed them, what was killing them? The venom, right? The venom was killing them. So I want you to take this, this bronze serpent, I want you to put it on a pole, and when the Hebrews see it, Anybody that's been bitten will be healed. It was kind of nuts, like taking a snake and putting it on a pole. Why a snake? Like, why not just take the Ark of the Covenant and put it out there in front of everybody? I mean, that represents you. God said that the Hebrews knew that cursed was anything that hangs on a tree. So if the Hebrews saw the snake that was being cursed on that tree, then the venom couldn't kill them anymore. So they knew because God's law said, cursed if anybody, anything that hangeth on a tree. So God, so God showed the Hebrews, I've now cursed the snake, which kills the venom. So now you can be healed. So when they looked at that tree, they could be healed. And it says, so the snake was lifted up in the wilderness. So the son of man must be lifted up. Why? So that if we see the price and what he really did, what was killing us has no right to touch us ever again. What was killing me? Drugs, pornography, alcohol, lust. I need whatever you got to make me feel better at the cost of you. All that stuff. What is that? It's sin. So sin waged war against us. And it said that when the law came, sin, it awakened sin. The law wasn't just to show us like the reality of how we could get to God. The law was to show us there was no way for us to get to God. Do you understand the law came to show us that there's no possible way that you could ever get to God on your own? Because you got 10 commandments and 613 laws. In order to get to God, you have to obey every one without missing any. It's an impossibility. Yet religion thinks it's possible. But to a guy like me, I mean, I was sharing with the students, you got... You got all these Jews that are raised by the law. They're raised in scripture. They're raised understanding the Torah. They are masters at scripture. And they, everything that they do, what they eat, they sleep, they, they breathe, they clothe, they eat, they tithe, they offer. Everything is under the law. And they learn it all and they're doing it diligently. And they're obeying the law. But they always fall short, but they're trying to do it their way. This was Saul when he was a Pharisee, he's trying to obey the law, and he's always messing up, yet he wants to keep the law. They tried, and they failed miserably. Romans 7 describes the reality of trying to obey the law in your free will. If you try to obey it in your free will without God, you fail, you fail miserably. There's no way to do it because it's sin inside of you 
that's doing this, that's making you fall short because the law awakens sin. So Jesus comes, pays the price on the tree. So the very thing that was killing us was sin. So God, it says that he who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, became sin on the tree. Jesus, in Galatians 3, 13, became, he was, cur- it was cursed on that tree because Jesus was hung on a tree. Any, anybody that hangs on a tree, anything that hangs on a tree was cursed. God didn't curse Jesus because he had never sinned. But Jesus became sin on the tree so God could curse sin. You, man, you gotta see this. Because he didn't pay a price for us to just be forgiven of sin. He paid a price for even like the reality of sin working in us would die. See, the Christian life, it, it's not, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. But the last thing I want to do is sin and get away with it. That's just dumb. Now that I have this, you know, Paul, Paul is this zealous Pharisee of Pharisees that is coming after to kill all these Christians, this sect, this, this, this thing that rose out of this lie of Jesus being resurrected. He gets knocked off his donkey on the way to persecute and kill Christians. And God's like, you know what? I want him. Top breed of Pharisee, top guy, smartest guy ever. God's like, yeah, he, he's going to be great. Prophesies about Saul. This guy is going to go through serious persecution to Ananias. I will show him he must suffer for my namesake. He's my chosen instrument to the Gentiles. Like the Jews are one thing. Saul knew everything about the law. And Saul, when you see him in scripture, he said, you know what? I consider myself to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. Why? Because the law did nothing for anybody and it didn't drive anybody to God. It showed us our desperate need for God because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Saul gets this radical encounter with Jesus. Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, the one whom you persecute. But he wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the church. But God thinks highly of the body of Christ. So Saul gets rocked by God. He gets, he goes to this house and then Ananias comes and Saul goes out and trains with Jesus for three and a half, almost four years in Arabia, comes back out of there, zealous and ready to go. And then Saul is this amazing apostle of love that actually wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Come on, maybe 14, possibly Hebrews. I think so, but we'll just leave it at that. And all of a sudden, Saul is preaching this glorious gospel of grace and the Jews want to kill him. Why? Because the Jews, these religious people, they follow the rules, they follow the laws. They've done this since they were little kids. Like they've grown up and you've got these Gentile party animals. You've got these pagans that worship idols, that worship Baal, that all this crazy stuff. And Saul tells the Jews, listen, none of the stuff that you've worked for your whole life is going to work. All of it's a wash. There's no possibility for you to even get saved that way. And the Jews are like, what are you trying to tell us? That there's no way except grace. And they were so mad. But the Gentiles, these Gentiles are like, what are you trying to say? Drunk out of their mind. So I was like, yeah, there's no way for you to be saved except by grace. So you're telling me we don't got to do what them Jews did? They didn't do it anyway. I'm not kidding you. This is what the big problem was. So I was like, no, it's only by his work that you can be saved. It's grace through faith. And all of a sudden, the Gentiles start coming in by the droves. And the Jews are like, kill him! All the persecution. Do you know why religious people are so angry? Because religious people think that by their good works, they maintain salvation. And your good works don't maintain salvation. Your salvation was freely given to you by grace. But a person like Ezekiel that was absolutely twisted and totally whacked out and had his throat cut, had his face cut, like almost died several times, solitary confinement, finds out what grace is and believes. And all of a sudden his sins and his lawless deeds are wiped out. His past is wiped out. And all of a sudden he's got great victory and great joy in God because he believes the truth. Yet a religious person that says, I've grown up in church, gets mad at a person like Ezekiel and says, wait a minute, you didn't do what I did. Yeah, it sounds cool. Testimony is cool, but I'm better than that. No, you're not. You're lost. You're lost and deceived because it's not about better. It's about God's goodness 
and God's grace and God's mercy. And it's about the inheritance that he's laid up for us that you don't understand unless you read the new covenant because the new covenant is the last will and testament. It's what Jesus who paid this price for you to receive everything from God. And we've all been given everything according to life and godliness. And every time you plug in and you start to read and understand, God wants to reveal to you all of the things that have been freely given to you. But one of the things that God never gave you is the ability for you to hang on to yesterday. I promise you. Go to Romans 8 real quick. I'm going to touch this and then we're going to pray. <laughs> oh, Jesus, help me. This is the last part of Romans 8. It says in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. As it's written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, I want you to hear me. For I am persuaded, verse 38, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to tell you a key to Saul, who then became Paul, his life, a key to Peter's life. You would definitely need some freedom if you were Peter and walked with Jesus for three years and then denied him to his face when he was being beaten and taken away. You would need freedom. I don't care who we are. See, we we know about Jesus. But Peter was friends with Jesus. Peter was actually brought into the inner circle. He's Peter, James, and John. And Peter was with Jesus all the time. He got his foot in his mouth, but he was with Jesus. And Peter was a close friend. When when things were intense, Jesus brought Peter, James, and John with him. The other disciples were kind of laid back or back behind. But these guys were the inner circle. So if anybody knew Jesus, it was Peter. Peter had an encounter with the goodness of God when he first met Jesus. When he said, let's go fishing, Peter's like, we fished all night, dude, whatever. They go out and fish. Peter throws the thing off, can't even lift up a fish. He's totally awestruck by this catch. Peter takes the job, his livelihood, everything that he knows to be right. And he has the biggest catch of his life, the biggest fundraising work time ever. And he walks away from all that to serve Jesus. But that day when all those fish got in the boat, Peter said, away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And he had an encounter with the goodness of God. It touched him. And three and a half years later, Jesus is getting taken away from him. Peter says, I'll never, ever, ever, ever let this happen to you. Jesus is like, Peter, even tonight, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter believed what he said, but he did deny him. Peter was going to need major restoration. Are you with me? If you think about that, how deep would that restoration have to be? How much does the body of Christ believe? How much therapy and how many counseling sessions would Peter have to have to get free from that? I don't think in the body of Christ we believe he could ever be free. Because we've created a monster out of counseling. And we've made the gospel small and counseling big. And I'm not against counseling, but I am not for you trying to do this thing without the counselor. And then you've got Saul. Saul's killing Christians, first Christian martyr. Stephen is martyred, is is stoned to death at Saul's discretion. They lay their clothes at Saul's feet. Saul's been persecuting this Christian thing. He's been putting, he's been ripping apart families. He's been, he's been doing the monster, he's been doing monster stuff, awful, wicked stuff. And then Jesus goes, Saul, interrupts his life. Saul's going to need major therapy. Are you hearing me? I'm talking about trauma, buddy. Taking a kid and killing a kid in front of the parents for the gospel. Like, what do you do? How do you fix that? Like, how do you get that out of your head? Like, how do you do that? 
Like, how do you get it out? There's only one way. See, the conscience is violated with sin and a life of sin. And when you get saved, God wants to do something. See, the blood of animals covered over sin, but it never could take away sin. So you've got all these, these people in the world, like my life, I destroyed and hurt and, and absolutely was in a mayhem destruction festival trying to hurt as many as I could to make me feel better, as many drugs as I could do, as much porn as I could watch. The, all that stuff is there. How does a man like me get free? How does a man like Ezekiel or, or all these people, how do we get free from that? How do we, how do we get that voice to stop nagging at us? Well, first of all, we have to find out what voice is nagging at us. Is it the Father's? Because the Father doesn't nag it. The Father encourages. Jesus said, my sheep will hear and obey my voice, and the strangers they won't follow. So you have to understand that when it's a stranger's voice, you're not supposed to follow. It's actually a command not to follow. But in order to know what the stranger is and what the Father is, you have to submit, surrender, and give yourself completely to know Abba. Because he's the one that changes everything. So you've got Saul, you've got Peter. How are they going to get free from this? You know, you got in this scripture, in this set of scripture, it says this. It's a key here and most people miss it. But it says that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that death, life, angels, principalities, powers. And then it skips right over your past and it says things present and things to come. Your past didn't make the list because your past has the ability through unbelief to completely separate you from receiving God's love. See, when you see the gospel and you see the reality of this, see, I don't own my past anymore because God ripped it out of me and he threw it in a sea called forgetfulness. See, if we don't see the gospel for what it is, this crucial point stops you from building on a firm foundation. See, because the stumbling stone that Jesus said was coming, the stumbling stone, the Jews stumbled over it, the Gentiles stood on it. Because that stumbling stone was grace. See, the grace of God is good. There's nothing you could do to earn it. There's nothing you could do to pay enough of a price because none of us were worthy. Jesus, the one who was worthy, says it is finished. And that means the payment has been paid in full. I have paid complete payment and he dies. But the great news is, I mean, if he died right there, it would be bad news. Because what do we do? He did not die and stay dead. He died, paid the price for humanity, comes up out of that pit three days later. And on the third day, on the third day, it was the roughest day in history for the devil because he thought he had won, see? See, the devil thought he won. If I steal, kill, destroy, I win. You can keep that like your, your job description, but you can't kill my king because he never sinned. He never sinned. He never missed it, ever. <laughs> and he thought, if I kill him, I win. No, if you kill him, see? The truth is, is if the powers and principalities would have known what they were doing, they would have never crucified Jesus. But they did. See, if the powers and principalities would have known what they were doing, they would have killed everybody trying to crucify Jesus. They wouldn't have allowed him to be touched. Because that's the only way for the devil to actually win, is to leave Jesus alone. But the devil is not so smart. He's not. He's, he's crafty, he's a serpent, and he lies. So what he's trying to do is lie to you to convince you that your past isn't gone, that it's still there. If it was gone, why do you keep thinking about it? Nope, that's a lie from hell. The truth is, is the blood of Jesus, like we sing it, we sing the blood of Jesus, we sing it, we were singing it today, it was absolutely glorious. And you can feel God in the room, like this is why Jesus paid the price he did. For the redeemed of the Lord to say so. To actually say, I've been purchased by blood. God purchased me. Nobody can take that away. I've been accepted in the beloved. You can't reject me or take away what you never gave me. There's nobody that can take this away from me. Now, God wants me to not think of my past. Paul said in Philippians 3, one thing, one thing I've laid hold of, one thing, forgetting those things that lie behind, pressing forward to those things ahead to the upward call of what he's laid a hold of me for. The truth is, is that unless you see the truth of grace, 
the goodness of God, the mercy of God, and what he's done for you, you will constantly think of yesterday. And yesterday is illegal. Rearview Christianity in the kingdom is illegal. Your yesterday doesn't exist. There are people like, well, I've gone through therapy for years and years and years, and I'm finally almost to the place where my past is gone. I am sorry to say this, but the truth is, is that when you said yes to Jesus and you said, I do, he said, I am. I promise you. And he paid a price for us to be forgiven, but not just to be forgiven. John the Baptist didn't say, behold the Lamb of God that forgives the sin of the world. He said, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away. Taketh away is different than forgiveness. Forgiven is one thing, but if you took it away, that means that my sin no longer exists. So when I look into the mirror with an unveiled face, because the Lord is the Spirit, with the Spirit of the Lord is there's liberty. And when I look in the mirror with an unveiled face, the veil's removed in Christ. When I look in the mirror, I see Christ in me, the hope of glory. He paid a high price to come live in me, and he likes to be here. He's not sad about being here. If I'm making mistakes, he's still not sad about being here. He just knows that the revelation of grace, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the truth of scripture, when it hits your soul, you will never look back, you'll only look up. And when you behold the lamb, woo! When you behold the lamb, you start to step into the reality of the reward of his suffering. And you start to give him the reward of his suffering. And when you see your inheritance, you won't be afraid to write the big check. And I'm not talking about your money. I'm talking about a man that's paralyzed. You won't be afraid to tell him that there's hope for you and that Jesus can heal you. You won't, you won't be afraid to talk to somebody across the table that has kidney failure and say, God's going to heal you right now. It's called faith and it's impossible to please God without faith. So why wouldn't you want to start your journey with it? in faith, with full surrender, believing and understanding what this Bible says about you, what the inheritance that you really have in. Because the more you don't see that you have, the more you fail to write the check. See, write the check. I'm using that expression. Unless you know what's in your account, you can't write a check. Unless you know what's in your account, you can't write a check. If I told you that there was a million dollars in your account, you would write some checks. Easy. You would. But if I told you that you've been given everything according to life and godliness and the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and if I told you that the miracles that Jesus did, these same miracles Jesus said that I do, he who believes in me is going to do, and greater things am I going to do, are they going to do? Because I'm going to go be with the Father. And that everything has been given to me and it's all mine, but it's not for me to hoard, it's for me to give away. And the gifts and callings of God and and what he has given us is absolutely amazing. And he does not get the fulfillment of his inheritance that he's placed in you until you start to step out and write the check. What am I saying? Like, write the check. You keep saying that. I'm not talking about finances. I'm saying, okay, someone has cancer. I don't know. Like, what's in my account? Oh, that's right. You paid a price for the healing of cancer. What's in my account? Write the check. Jesus signs it. Healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. That's what I'm talking about. So why don't we step into faith? Why don't we surrender and give ourselves to this glorious grace, this goodness of God, this mercy of God? Believe God and go after sickness and crush this stuff. But why don't you go after who you are in Christ and find out your identity so you stop being ruled, manipulated, and lied to by the devil. Stop thinking about yesterday when your yesterday didn't make his list. Come on. Angels, powers, principalities, powers, life, death, things present and things to come. Your past did not make the list because Jesus' blood paid the price for you to be forgiven. Your sins removed as far as the east is from the west. Your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. God doesn't see you for your faults and your failures. He sees you for your yes. Can I get everybody to stand please? I went all along, sorry. Worship got me really excited today. I got a question for you guys. If you're dealing with this whole guilt, shame, condemnation thing, and it seems to be ruling your life, I'm talking depression, bipolar disorder, all that stuff. God delivered me from bipolar, from the voices, to where I only listen to His voice. 
Because when the stranger speaks, I am so in love with God that his voice trumps all the other voices. And when you hear his voice, these voices are extinguished. They actually don't have a voice. Why? Because he set up home inside of you. There's a no vacancy sign on your forehead, fully occupied by truth. Come on. If you're here and you know you need to get right with God and you don't understand what grace is and you've been stuck in repetitive religion and you've been going through the motions or you're backslidden, doesn't matter, any of those things, I want you to come up here real quick. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. I really do love you. You guys might not know it, but I love Jesus, with, which makes me love myself. You know why I can love me? Because God forgave me. That's exactly right. And when I look at myself in the mirror, I see a man that's been forgiven and washed by the blood of Jesus. And that's what we all need to see. No guilt, no shame, no regret. Come on. And that whole don't want to be alive anymore thing leaves you today. Amen because you are valuable and you are worth it and God's a good father. You all are worth it. God's a good father. Come on, joy. Come on. Come on. God's a good father. Amen. No more religion. Just relationship with the king. That's a good deal. Woo. You're a champion. The devil's afraid of you. I'm not kidding. Guys, this is why we're alive. This is why we're alive. This is why we're alive. To give ourselves completely. God gives us freedom. He's about to bring great freedom to you. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm so excited. Because I look into your eyes and I, I can see where you've been. But not, that's not where you are right now. Where you've been isn't where you are. We've all messed up. We've all messed up. Dude, I can't go back and fix any of that stuff. If I could, I would. God had a better plan. He said, I'm going to give them the blood of my son and I'm going to wash away everything they wish they'd never done. He's going to take away all guilt, all shame, and all condemnation. Why? Guilt says it's still who I am. Or I'm not forgiven. Shame says it's still who I am. Condemnation says I'm worthy of judgment. When you say yes to Jesus, you're no longer worthy of judgment. The ruler of this world has been judged. Grace comes and he takes that old spirit out of you and he gives you a brand new spirit. And then the greatest thing is, is we learn what the Bible says. And at first, it's a little different to read it because it doesn't make any sense to our brain. And book smart, we try to get book smart. You can't be book smart with the Bible. The Bible's meant for your heart, not meant for your head. Because your heart can take you places your brain can't fit. So the most important thing is, is to have some people around you to help you, to pour into you to be able to strengthen you in your faith. Amen? Because it's not just about praying a prayer. It's about being discipled. Being discipled. It's about people coming around you saying, hey, we want to be family to you. We want to love you. We want to take care of you. And we want you to know who you are so the devil doesn't manipulate you any longer. And you get people that are walking in God to come around you and say, you got this. Come on. Brothers and sisters, to come around you. And it's not where you've been. Right now, that thing dies. Amen? All right. Ooh, I love it so much. Come on, just, just lift your hands. And if I can get some uh, ministry team to come up here with some folks up front, please. Surround them with, with your love. <laughs> I want you to pray with me right now. I want you to say this with me. Jesus, I don't want to live this way no more. I see my need for you more than ever. I've done so much that I wished I'd not. And this gospel is so good that you take that stuff away from me as if I never did it. If I could go back and change it, I would. But it's impossible. This gospel is so good that it's almost too good to be true. In life, we're taught if it's too good, 
It's probably not true. That is perversion of grace. This gospel is so good because God is truth. Today, I ask you to forgive me and wash me clean from all of my junk. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I want you, God, to be Lord over my life. Wash it away. Let the blood wash me clean. In Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit. Why don't you say that? Come, Holy Spirit. And fill me now. Come right now. Holy Spirit. We want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Guys, I want you to pray in the Spirit. Everyone is praying for them right now. That's right. Come on. Come on, God. Come. Let it burst forth from them right now. Jesus, 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 come. Come on, God. More, 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 more. Let it come forward right now. Since if we ask God, He'll give us the Holy Ghost. God, I ask you to clothe them, God. So they're ready for battle immediately in Jesus' name. Warriors ready for battle. Come on. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Anthony, get with this one. Freedom. 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 Jesus. I want everybody out there to put their hand on somebody. We're going to pray for healing all over the room. These folks already have hands laid on them. We're going to pray for them too. God is awesome. He wants to take away our sickness, take away our disease. He wants to heal us of everything that we're dealing with. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus right now for healing and wholeness all over the room. Healing over necks and backs in Jesus' name. Healing over organs in the mighty name of Jesus, God. We thank you. I want you to say that with me. Necks be healed. Backs be healed. Discs be healed. Organs be healed. Brand new hearts. Brand new livers. Brand new kidneys. Brand new digestive system. Brand new blood. Blood disease, get out. Any disease that came from drugs, we break your power right now in the name of Jesus. Liver be healed. Hepatitis C, get out. Blood disorders be healed. Venereal diseases be healed. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for wholeness right now. Scars disappear in Jesus' name. Cutting scars, get out. Track marks disappear. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for healing. We thank you for wholeness. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. Cartilage be healed. ACL be healed. Rotator cuff be healed.
sleeping disorders be healed. I hear it again, digestive, digestive diseases be healed right now. Acid reflux be healed right now. Be made whole. Migraine headaches disappear. Deaf ears open in Jesus' name. Pituitary gland be healed. Tumors be removed. Cancer be healed. Drug addiction be broken in Jesus' name. Be broken right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Dementia be healed. Disorders of the mind right now be healed. ADHD be healed. Bipolar disorder, get out. Infertility be healed in Jesus' name. Prodigal children come home in Jesus' name. I feel like there's someone here that that was into witchcraft and you believe that this thing has been following you and it's and it won't leave you who is that you were around you were around witchcraft cult stuff and you believe this thing's following you where are you come up here oh bro that thing's done no joke Amen. That's leaving, bro. That was direct. That was a direct, you sunk my battleship from the Lord. I promise, man. This thing's leaving. Anthony, get around this guy. Come on, bro. Come on, just, just lay hands on him. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We break the power of any witch in the name of Jesus, of any cult, none of that stuff. Look, the law says I revisit a third and fourth generation generational curse. Jesus became the curse on that tree so that no generational curse could follow us through. There is no generational curse that makes it through the blood of Jesus, buddy. You've crossed bloodlines. This thing's done today. God, thank you for every bit of that stuff. God, we clear his home right now. We wash that with the blood of Jesus. We thank you. Absolute freedom. In the mighty name of Jesus, absolute freedom. Absolute freedom absolute freedom Katie guys real quick I want you to check your body for anything physical that you could check your shoulders check your back check your knees just check right now all around the room I need you to check really check it try to do something that you couldn't do Who here right now has freedom where they didn't have freedom before? Wave your hand at me so I can see what's happening healing wise. Come on, wave your hand. If you know, if healing is happening in your body right now, wave both your hands in the air so I can see. Okay. Okay. If, if you're here and you have an ear that's deaf, put your hand up. You have a deaf ear. Okay, right here. You have a deaf ear here, here. Where at? Okay, all right. I just want you to put your ear, put your hands on their ears. No, other people. Ah, you heard me. No, I'm just kidding. If you're here, I just want other people around you to put their hands on your ears. How many of you believe Jesus will open the ears of the deaf? 
All right, where, where are we praying at? Put a hand up in a group. Okay, here, here, here. All right, okay. All right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna believe God that he's gonna pop open deaf ears right now, okay? You guys, that didn't even sound enthusiastic at all. Come on. All right, on the count of three, we like to do it like this. We just yell pop because Jesus wants to pop open a deaf ear. When a, a deaf ear pops open, it's significant. It's pretty amazing. We've been seeing them everywhere on planes and everywhere because God's good. Amen. All right. So on the count of three, we're going to yell pop. We're going to believe that Jesus Christ is going to open these ears because he paid the price on Calvary. What we're doing is we're actually giving Jesus the reward of his suffering. Do you understand? He paid a price for us to be healed saved, healed, delivered, protected, made whole, kept safe, and fr- kept safe and sound. That's the word sozo. That's the word saved. To be saved means to be saved, to be healed, to be delivered, to be made whole, to be kept safe and sound, to be kept safe from harm. So on the count of three, we're going to yell pop. Ready? One, two, three. Pop! I want to know if there's any difference in any ear right now. If there's a difference in your ear, come on, back there. Come on, come on, come on. Where else? Is there a difference in any other ear right now where your ear opened? All we need is one. Where? Come on. Is it better? Do it again. Let's pray again. We want to completely heal. Amen. Come on. Let's do it again. Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus for brand new ears. God, we thank you that you, Jesus, you're the only one that opens up the ears of the deaf. There's no other gods before you. You are the only one in true God. We thank you. Father, we thank you right now deaf ears we command you open because Jesus Christ opens the ears of the deaf one two three pop what do you got what do you have what's he got Amen. Come on. Any breakthrough yet? Does he have any breakthrough? No? Is there anything? Don't lie. Little? Got some? Poquito? Let's do it again. Come on. Let's do it. Why not? You're worth it. Let's do it. Let's, let's do it again, okay? Father, we thank you for brand new ears in the name of Jesus right now all over the room. Thank you. God, I thank you for miracles, signs, and wonders. God, thank you for doctors confirmed healing. That discs will be healed. That organs will be healed. Brand new. Brand new hearts. Brand new lungs. Brand new kidneys. Thank you for brand new ears. God, you said having ears to hear. Jesus, you said, he who has ears, let him hear. I know that spiritual ears, but we need physical ones too. God, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Ears. Open on the count of three. One, two, three. Pop! Who here has breakthrough in their ears? Wave your hand at me. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. It's awesome. Amen. All right, I want everybody to find one person. Find one person. I want you to help me pray. We're going to pray one more time. Come on. I know. This is the time when everybody looks at me like, why? Because we're the body of Christ. We're just going to pray for people. Come on. Let's find one person. 
Someone come up here and be with this gentleman. I need a, I need a guy up here. I want you to ask them what they need breakthrough for right there in their life. Just one of you ask the other. What do you need breakthrough for right now? All right, and then the other person, tell them what you need breakthrough for. So you both know. All right, I want you to, I want you to pray amazing over that person right now. I just want you to release a blessing over them right now. Release a blessing over them. Pray for them right now, come on. Lift your voice, don't be afraid. This is a very safe place.